Okay, the uh, problem you're working on, problem one on the gold packet, starts out exactly the same as uh, one of the ones, sorry, the green packets, the same as the first one in the gold. This idea of an amusement park, so that is not new, so I won't reread that. But we do have a new question. The question says, at what time, again, make sure you read slow and careful. So we're supposed to be finding a time. Between 9 and 23, does the model predict that the number of people? So now, if you remember back to the gold packet, uh, one of the earlier questions for this FRQ had you create an equation for the number of people in the park. So I often use n to represent the amount of people in the park. Uh, this one used n. So that showed up in part C. We're now working on part D. So they want to know what is the number of people in the park. They want to know what n. is a maximum, so when n is greatest. Thank you. Hey, look at me. Look up. Look here. Uh, again, this style of problem really is common. It happens a lot on the AP test. Um, you should always stop on an FRQ once you get like a comma or a question mark and they've asked you to do something, don't keep reading. Usually all that does is kind of clutter your brain with excess information that you don't need to worry about yet. So in an FRQ, I'm going to stop right there and focus on that. I'll read the rest later. Um, I figured out that I need to figure out the max of n. Okay, it's critical that you notice that they did not use the word relative or local. A relative or local max is different than a max. So whenever they use, whenever they want you to find a relative or a local max, they will specifically use one of those two words. Otherwise, they're asking you to find a global or absolute max. However, when looking for a global or absolute max, they'll use all kinds of different words. They'll say greatest, most, least, highest, coldest, your hottest, whatever. But if it's relative or local, they have to use the word relative or local. So what you're really looking for is the fact that relative and local was not used, so you know that you're looking for absolute. The process is different, so you must make sure you separate the two. Questions? Please. Because it's um, at a time interval from 9 to 23, can't it not be like this global max though? Because it's a limited area? Oh. A really good question. They're simply asking you to find, so, so think of it this way. Uh, N represents the number of people in the park. So if I were to make a list comparing the number of people in the park with hours in the day, I would get a long list of different values of numbers in the park. I'd start at 9 in the morning, and I would go to hour 23, now we just get, you know, just different numbers in the park at all different times. They're simply asking you to look everywhere in this list and find the time, whatever it happens to be, when this number is highest in that time span. And that's what they're referring to. Does that make sense? I was wondering, like, could there be, like, a higher number than a different, like, hour, like, all right, you're saying it really well. There absolutely could be a value of n that would be larger outside of 9 and 23, but in, for the purposes of this problem, we don't care. Okay. Yeah, we're looking for the absolute max of n within that time period. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. It's well stated. Anybody else? Please. So what determines if it is 
because we're looking for an absolute max of n in this, why can't it be called a relative max of n for this time period? Like, what, what's the difference between those two terms? So here's the difference. Uh, we don't know what, like if we were to try and make a graph of n, we don't really know what that graph looks like at this moment. So let's just take some possibilities. Um, not likely, but it is possible that you'll encounter a problem. Because remember, we don't really care. All we care is that we keep track of amount versus rate versus rate of the rate. We don't really care what we're keeping track of. So in this problem, we're keeping track of the number of people, but it doesn't change my thinking if I'm keeping track of gallons of water. So try to ignore what we're keeping track of. Just focus on, hey, we're, we're dealing with an amount. It's an amount of something. If we drew a graph of our amount, it's possible the amount starts low and just gets more and more and more. So don't overthink it. Just raise your hand. I'll pay everyone. Uh, when would we identify the absolute max of n occurring? Hands up. Just don't overthink it. It's just right in front of you. When would you say that n has its highest value? And it's the far right. So we'd say, yeah, that's logical. The highest point of n occurs at whatever time that happens to be. How many know it? Points three for me. Uh, raise your hand, please. Does this graph of n have a relative max? Yes or no? Hands up. Does this graph of n have a relative max? Reviewing relative max from first semester. Tickets for everybody. Points for everybody. Let's go, Jonathan. Uh, no. How many agree? Two points. Three for Jonathan. The definition is n has a relative max when n changes increase to decrease. This example of n never changed to increase to decrease. So n doesn't have a relative max. n does have a max. Does that help answer the yes. Yeah, very good. It is possible, three for Daniel. It's actually very common to encounter a problem where the amount varies like this. So raise your hand and tell me where is the absolute max of this particular n? Where's the absolute max, Logan? Uh, in the middle at the top of the arc. How many agree? Two points, three for Logan. Uh, please raise your hand. Does N have a, does this red version of N have a relative max, yes or no? Let's go along. How many agree? Two points, three for Lana. This graph of N does change increase to decrease. So it is actually quite common for the highest point on N to occur at the same location as a relative max. It just doesn't have to. Questions? Cool. Let's come back to here. Um, here's another place where a lot of errors have occurred in the past. We are discussing problems where you have to keep track of the amount, the rate, and the rate of the rate. Uh, Make, to be fair, if you make one small error and get them mixed up, you'll lose all the points because your problem won't make any sense. Like you'll do lots of computations, but the grader can't give you anything because it doesn't make sense. So be very careful in keeping track of each of those three. So we're trying to find where n is greatest. So I have a rule that I named. It's not really my rule, but I couldn't find an official name for this process. So I just called it the uh, min-max theorem. So whenever we're looking for an absolute min or max, we're going to follow what I call the min-max theorem. I call it the min-max theorem because it works for finding the greatest or least value of anything. It doesn't matter whether you're looking for the highest or lowest. It works either way. Um, this right here, you have to take a different approach. We're not going to actually go looking for the highest point. We're going to look at where the highest point might occur 
and we refer to those as the candidates. And then what we do is we eliminate candidates. So we're going to be doing a process of elimination. The reason for that is they give you, usually on an FRQ like this, it's worth three or four. And usually two to three of the points that are available are for the justification. So even if you find the correct answer, you're only going to get one point unless your justification meets their standards. And their justification is built around this idea of eliminating candidates. So that's where we have to focus. Question? Okay. Well, we can't really eliminate candidates until we know what the candidates are. Uh, the candidates are all found based on this rule right here. The absolute min or max always is located at a critical or end point of the function itself. And then you remember from semester one, the critical points of F are always where the derivative of F is either zero or undefined. Okay? Uh, you need to do whatever is necessary to get that written down and memorized uh, because you have to follow that process, otherwise you have no chance of getting any points on a problem like this. And you have to be careful against not get the amount, the rate, and the rate of the rate mixed up. In this problem, the amount that we're discussing is a number of people, so we're calling that n. We're trying to find where n is greatest. That means we've got to identify the possible times where n is greatest. Well, n is going to be greatest at any time where n prime is either equal to zero or undefined. That's where you have to start the problem. So I'll give you a chance to write down whatever you want to write down, but you have to get that memorized. There's no way to succeed on these problems without that. Questions? Please. Yeah, it's a lot of words, so I try to kind of make the wording on the board as complete as possible. If I'm trying to memorize it, I kind of try to make it a shorter memory. What I do is I think, okay, whenever I'm trying to find where something is either greatest or least, first got to keep track of well, I'm trying to find the greatest or least of what? But that's just a logical thought. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm trying to find where n is greatest. That's my question. And it really makes a, it really helps tremendously if you can stay with symbols, not words. Like get away from the words, go with the symbols, because then all the problems become the same problem. So n is greatest, that's my question. Now I remember the min-max theorem. Min-max theorem says n is greatest where uh, n prime is either equal to zero or n prime is undefined. I need to go find those points. There are two other candidates always. Uh, the other two candidates are always the beginning and end points of n itself. So I've got to make sure I don't forget that. But that's what's in my memory. I think it's not really important that you memorize the wording. It's only important that you memorize the idea. And this is the idea. n is going to be greatest either at some point where n is equal to zero, sorry, n prime, n prime is undefined, or at the end points of n itself. And keep in mind that, again, it's crucial that you not get mixed up 
Uh, here I'm talking about n being greatest. Here I'm identifying that n is greatest where the derivative of n is either zero or undefined, or at an end point of n itself. So your brain has to constantly switch back and forth between whether you're thinking of n or n prime. Points for Austin, please. So is it always the beginning and end point, or just end? Uh, so maybe I need to use a different word. Two points for Autumn. Uh, when I wrote the word end, I was referring to either the first, the end point on the left, or the end point on the right. So it would be the beginning or end of in itself. Question. Cool. So using that, here's what I do next. I say, okay, I'm trying to find where n is greatest. So. I need to identify where n prime is either equal to zero or undefined. Now remember from our discussion last time, uh, I gave you the little hint that in all of these problems, and you've got amount, rate of the rate. We talked about how, so here we go, amount. That's our n. Rate is n prime. And we talked about how n prime is always the in rate, subtract the out rate. grab my calculator and I make a plot of that. Right here. I always put the in rate in Y1. I always put the out rate in Y2. Here's the in rate in Y1. Out rate in Y2. N prime is the difference between the in rate and the out rate. So I really just want to look at my graph of N prime. I don't need to look at the in rate and the out rate separately. I just need to look at the graph of N prime. So I'm going to turn off these upper two. Turn off the in rate, turn off the out rate. As Eric said, the time period is 9 to 23. I don't really care about any other times. So now I zoom fit for that time period. Don't let me go faster than you can make sense of it. So stop me at any moment and say, hey, please do that again. Please say it again. Please show it differently. You just give me things. Questions from anyone? Cool. Again, don't get mixed up. This is a graph of n prime. In fact, let's pull this over a little bit. So this is my graph of n prime. Graph over, but it's there we go. 
Um, So here's n prime. So this is n prime. It's obvious from the graph there's only one point where n prime is either zero or undefined. Uh, the worst I've seen, I think, is three. I've seen the AP problems where there will be three times when the graph you're looking at might be zero or undefined. I don't think I've seen problems that become more complex than that for the AP test. So I need to identify that time. So I go back to my calculator. It's uncooperative. There it goes. So I go find that zero, so that's second trace. Zero. Back it up. Take the left bound, right bound. Make sure it says the word zero. Make sure you don't just write it down, but you store it. So I'm going to come back here. number was 15.795. Write that down. N prime is equal to zero at time equal 15.795. You need to make sure I save that for future use. I've been using A on this problem to represent the amount, so I don't want to use the letter A. So the letter B will work just fine. Question. And don't hesitate to ask me to do anything again. It doesn't bother me at all. I want to make sure this makes sense. So. Cool. So I need to store that time. So go back to my calculator. Make sure it says zero. Then I second quit. And it's the x coordinate I'm wanting to store. So I type x. I type store. And I put it in alpha b. And then I look at the screen to make sure it's stored what I think it's stored. 15.795, that's correct. Questions? Okay. Back to here. So just restating. Got to make sure I keep track of amount versus rate. I'm looking for when the amount is greatest. But the min-max theorem says the amount's going to be greatest at a time where the rate is equal to zero or undefined. So I've identified where the rate is equal to zero, but I also have to worry about the endpoints. So now I'm going to write this on my paper. So n of t, not n prime, n of t is greatest at t equal, uh, let's give some points. Show me on your hand like this, don't show everyone, just show me. Uh, remember the min-max theorem says that the amount is going to be greatest at a critical or end point of the amount critical or end point of the amount. The critical points of the amount occur where the rate is equal to zero or undefined. But the candidates where n can be greatest are both the critical points of n and the end points of n. So show me on your hand. We have one candidate, two, three, four, or five. Show me how many candidates have we now identified. In other words, how many times have we identified where n can possibly be greatest? 
Remember, the theorem says n can be greater as either the first point of n, the last point of n, or at any point of n where the rate is equal to 0 or undefined. So how many candidates have we found? 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. It's how many possibilities have we found? Show me some. gets three points. Work them down for voting. We've actually found three candidates. The first candidate is the first time, which is time nine. The second candidate is this time where the rate can equal zero, which is time B. And the third candidate Let's write this a little differently. Maybe it'll make better sense. So, n of t is greatest at either the first endpoint, the second endpoint, or the point where the rate is equal to zero. we call time B. So at one, oops, not zero, nine, sorry. So at one of these times, remember it's the min-max theorem. So at one of those times, the amount N is guaranteed to be either the highest value of N or the lowest value of N. This is what we mean by a candidate's test. We've identified three candidates. Questions. Okay. Um, on an AP test, what we've done so far is often work either one or two points, just kind of depends on the question. Uh, now what we have to do is we have to eliminate two of the three candidates. So we've got to prove to the grader that two of those are the wrong answer, only one of them is the right answer. Uh, there are different ways you can eliminate candidates. In this particular problem, the easiest way is to simply tell the grader what is the value of n at each of those times. Because again, you're guaranteed that n will be greatest and lowest at one of those three times. So all I have to do is tell the grader the value of n at each time. One of the times was given in the beginning because they told us at hour nine, the number of people in the park is zero. I write that down. Now I just need to go find how many people are in the park at this time and this time. So I use the fundamental theorem. I say the number of people, this is what you did on the gold packet, in the park at time B. You can use the letter B because you've told the grader that's the same thing as 15.795. It's going to equal, there are no one in the park to begin with. We then integrate the rates from time 0 to time B. Wouldn't it be time 9 to time B? Oh, thank you. That's Paul's idea. <laughs> Three points for Paul, two points for Zimmer for being spokesperson. Um, so, That will tell me how many are in the park at time B. So I'm going to write that down. So I grab my calculator. And I say math 9. Start at hour 9. Go to hour B. Integrate Y3 because Y3 is my N prime. Nine fifty point six eight zero. I always use three decimals until I'm told to do otherwise. So 
last year. Does anyone need me to do it again? Anything? Please, Mark. Um, Park at hour 23. So I write that down. It's the same thing. If you want, you can do this. Go up and grab that one again. Change the B to 23. It's not a lot faster, but it's useful in some cases. So 1.014. <laughs> some poor lone security guard walking the park at 11 o'clock at night. Um, 1.014. <laughs> you look up. Okay, finding the min or max is not really that hard. It just seems to be a challenge to get your head to remember the details that are necessary. So just reviewing again, we're looking for when n is greatest. So what you want your brain to do is say, okay, the min-max theorem says n is going to be greatest either at the beginning point of n, right here, the final point of n, or at a critical point of n. And the critical points of n occur when the rate of change of n is either zero or undefined. So we've got that right here. And then now all we have to do is the elimination process. We've got to check each of those and find which of those is the correct answer. So we checked n of 9, that was easy. We checked n of the critical point. We checked n of the final end point. We now know that the, we know the time, 
And we know how many are in the park at that time. Question. Yeah. Sorry, this is like towards the beginning of the problem You're that fine. I've been wondering. Um, yeah. Is it fine to use N of T when we already defined it as the amount plus the 300 that were in the park before opening? Gotcha. So that's my fault for confusing you. Um, when we did the gold packet, what I was trying to do is give you kind of several different examples of the different scenarios you might encounter in a lot of different problems. And so I invented that idea of there being 300 to start with. In this actual AP problem, uh, there was never any mention of 300 to begin with. And so that, I can see totally why that would mix you up. That's my fault. Um, in the actual AP problem, uh, which we are solving today, uh, there was never that part of it. So that's your question. It's perfect. Anybody else? Okay, now what you want to do is you go back, because look, that took quite a bit of mental energy to like, get all of that down on my paper and remember everything. So I want to go back and reread the problem, make sure I haven't forgotten something. So I come back to here. It says, at what time does the model predict that the number of people in the park is a maximum? So I need to, an I need to answer the problem because I have so much work. I don't want the grader to get lost and say, well, yeah, you did all the work, but you never answered anything. So write down an answer. Here's my answer. N of T is greatest. At T equal. I got to check for rounding. At what time does the model predict that the number of people in the park is a maximum? It does not ask for anything rounded, so make sure you do three decimals. 15.795. Make sure you include units. So I've answered that portion of the problem, please. One second, Elizabeth. Uh, I think you heard what I was saying. So it doesn't tell us to round the time. It does say round to the nearest whole number. It says round it to the nearest whole number. What is the number of people in the park at that time? And then all my work is my justification. So what I've got to be careful with is the time was not supposed to be rounded but the number of people is supposed to be rounded. So come back to here. And I write down. So n of t is greatest at that time. And then I like to use a short way of writing it. The number of people in the park at that time, because it asked me to figure that out. That's equal to and now, as Elizabeth said, now I've got to make sure I do round to the nearest whole number. So it's got to be 39.51. So I like to get my symbols defined. That makes my writing a lot less. I don't have to keep writing number of people in the park. I can just use N. Make sure you have units. Jackson, please. So is the only reason why we're not using time equal B because we have to put the units? Hold one second. There would be nothing wrong with writing N of T is greatest at time equal B hours. Uh, you'll get full credit for that as long as you have somewhere on your work stated that B is equal to 15.795. Was that your question? Yeah. That's perfect. Anybody else? Please, Jonathan. So this whole time we've been using the graph of the rate uh, you know, find the critical points. So why don't we just do the graph of the amount and look at it and see where it goes from? Gotcha. This is one where I don't have a great answer for you other than I know how they award points. And they're expecting you to prove using the rate when the amount is greatest. 
so even though it is possible and it's totally logical to say, why don't we just graph the amount and just find where the amount is highest or lowest? Uh, they don't allow that. Uh, they're wanting you to use this method. There are real life situations where this method is the only one would, that would work because there wouldn't be a way to actually graph the amount. That's, I'm being a little facetious just because I know that's the rules of the test. But anyway, does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Please. Um, for the like tests, will you be using like an extra booklet of like blank papers they can do or work on? Just sorry, it's like you're not how much. Gotcha. Yeah. It feels like we're using a lot of space because it's the first time we've done it. Uh, you'll find out that with practice, the space like I've given you here is actually more than enough. Yeah, they, I've never had a student come back and complain about how much space there is. They don't give scratch paper, but they do a very good job of making the booklets appropriately sized. That's a good question. Please. I just have a question about like abbreviations that we can make, and I don't, I don't quite know how to explain what it looks like. Could I write it on the board? Sure. This board's a little hard to write on, so I'm going to do it right here, if that's okay. All right. That one's just tricky. So I think this would be a lot faster than writing out way or greater is if we did R and then 8. This means 3. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I also think it could be applied to like greatest. I'm paying a ticket for creativity for sure. And I got to write it over here so that people in the video know what we're talking about. So the proposal is to use this in place of this and to use, <laughs> um, use this. They didn't really save a whole lot on that one, but you know. I guess we count letters. One, two, three, six versus, what is it? Let's say two, you know, <laughs> six versus eight, so. I just figure it'd be a lot faster than writing out all those letters. I honestly don't think they'll allow it. <laughs> but if you wanted to make a few, I think the grader would, um, it's your choice whether you want to do it or not. Um, I do think there's a pretty good possibility that if on the very first page you say, dear grader, I'm going to use the following symbols, uh, that you might get a really good laugh out of it and give you full credits. I think I'll do that. That's clever. I think we should all do that on that, actually. That's, uh, please don't. I'll, I'll have a heart attack. Uh, I'm working really hard to help you all think it's more. <laughs> Well, I get a letter back from the APU, like, what's up, John, what did you teach you? One greater gets all of the lone people. What is going on? <laughs> so that's awesome. Um, I must have not learned this. <laughs> wow. You get a point. Anybody else? Go on. Yeah, let's, we've got time for one more before the period is over, so let's keep going. <laughs> All right, number two. Number two. So this is the one we started on the gold packet as well, where they actually give us a symbol for the amount. So in this case, the amount is P of T. And that amount is measured in gallons. The rate they give us a formula for the rate this time, P prime. So this time there is no in rate and out rate, just the rate. That would be gallons per day. Uh, this problem doesn't seem to concern itself with the rate of the rate, although it often will. Questions so far? Also remembering from the gold packet, I want to write down that the amount of pollution in the lake at time zero, day zero, is 50 gallons. The question says, at what time T will the number of gallons of pollutant 
be at its minimum, then I, there's a question mark. So I'm going to stop there and do that first. At what time is the number of gallons a minimum? So P represents the number of gallons. So now I can use my min-max theorem. So this is back to Eric's question. I think on this round we can show you how it really doesn't take that much writing to get all the points. So I am thinking to myself, let's see the min-max theorem says the amount P is greatest Okay, what I'm writing in pink is not required to be written on the AP test. It is required that you remember it, so that's why I'm writing it on the board. So PFT is greatest at, oh, thank you, minimum this time. So least, okay, that's good, that's fewer letters since we're really trying to get fewer letters here. Um, <laughs> You can do this, they won't dock you for spelling. So. <laughs> <laughs> it looks kind of weird, but um, <laughs> they're not going to take out points for a misspelled word, so that's okay. Um, so if you really want to like emphasize, you know, you can go crazy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can't handle it. Um, let's see. <laughs> so PMT is least. Uh, let's see. Uh, the beginning time is zero. So that's a possibility. Uh, I guess putting that word I there kind of helps us remember that we're looking at several different candidates here. PMT is least at either uh, time equals zero. Or, oh, something different about this problem. They do not give a final time. Yeah, I was just going to point that out. Like, what do we do for what's the end point at the or on the right? Yeah, let me show you how that works because I've got to deal with that somehow. So, I'm thinking, so in fact, look, I'm thinking this and I'm hitting the roadblock that Zarin's talking about. I'm like, okay, wait a minute, something's a little messed up. So let's go find P prime equal to zero first here. So let's see, let's get our calculator, P prime. So this is 2002B number two. Load that up. Okay, so there's my graph of P prime. There's my graph of the rate. I want to look at the rate and find when the rate is equal to zero or undefined. Uh, they don't give a window, so I tried 0 to 10 to start with. When I did 0 to 10, uh, I did not find when P prime is equal to 0. So I've got to make my window bigger. So, not really knowing what to pick, I often will just double. So I'm going to go to 20. Zoom fit. That didn't work either, so I'm going to hit stop, so that's the on key. Hit my window and double again. Go to 40. Zoom fit. Ah, uh, that one's going to work. Hey, there we go. So I want to find that. So that's a second trace, two, enter, come on, enter again, enter again, make sure it says zero, 30.174, so come back to here, make a note of that. P prime of T is equal to zero at T equal 30.174, was that right? I need to store that somewhere. I can put it in 
Uh, B again works good. Yeah. So we'll come back to here. Oh yeah, Edward. Um, so I don't know if it's the nature of my calculator, but I got 30.2. Would that be acceptable? No, actually. Okay. value. Put it in B. Make sure I see the right value stored. So that's good. Okay, back to here. This is Zaren's question now. Okay, every eyes on the board. This is new. Okay, start out the problem exactly the same. I'm trying to find where P is least. I think, you know, remembering the min-max theorem, which says P is least at the beginning time, which is zero a time where the rate is equal to zero or undefined. That's right here. Or at the final time. There is no final time. So there it, it is still possible that t can be graded at greatest at some time more than 30. So what I'm going to write on my paper is this. Let's get rid of these. We don't need those right now. I write on my paper, t of t is least at either t equals 0 or where that's equal to there, or at some time at t greater than 30.174. That's the best I can do, because there is no right hand ending time. Question. Okay, so now I go to work proving all this. So, I know what P of zero is. I've already done that. I don't need to rewrite it. I, need, I do need to go find the amount of pollutant at time B. So the amount of, amount of pollutant at time B is going to equal 50 plus the integral from time 0 to time b of p prime. Question. Hurrying a little bit, sorry. So I grab my calculator. I type 50 plus. Actually, I like to do this separate. I think it makes more sense. So I'm going to do math 9. I go from time 0 to time B. I'm going to integrate P prime, which is in Y1. Oh, alpha trig. That was your name, Cambria. So put an X there. And remember, when you integrate the rates, you do not calculate an amount. You calculate how much the amount changed. So over that time period, the amount of pollutant went down by 14. But we started with 50, so I've got to include that. So it's a plus 50. Now that tells me how much pollutant is in the lake at that time. 35.104, so I write that down. Okay, here's how I handle the dilemma that Zarin noticed. What do I do with all this time that occurs after that point? 
Well, I go back to my graph and I look at the graph of P prime and I notice that as far as I can tell, in fact, I'm going to make the window a little bit bigger. Let's go to say 100. Ah, shoot. I don't want that. Come on, stupid calculator. Change this to 100. Sorry, the clock's making me raise. What I noticed from this graph of P prime is that after time 30, uh, the values of P prime appear to always be positive. If I'm uncertain, I can graph a little more just to you know, get some confidence. So I use that and I write the following. Uh, for t greater than 30.174 days, don't leave, p prime is positive. So, P of T is increasing. So right there, I've taken care of all time after this time. Because I've just proven to the grader that I understand that it, I don't need to check any of those times. Because for all of that time, P is going to be going up. Because I'm trying to find where P is least. None of those times will make any difference. That finishes the justification. Now all I have to do is make sure I answer the problem correctly, which means it said find the time. So now I just have that concluding statement, which is, uh, you can leave if you want. I'm just going to finish writing this. So my final answer would be P of T is least or lowest, whatever, at T equal, make sure I use units here, 30.174 days. Uh, the amount of pollution at that time they do not ask me to round this time, so I don't. It's 35.104 gallons. That's it. Thank you.